Are we recording yet? No. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. If you're here for uh, Linux 102, the schedule was printed wrong. I'm not talking about Linux 102. Uh, you missed that session earlier. Sorry. Um, if you're here for the democratization of computing and how Google keeps your cloud running, you are in the right place. I, uh, in between when I submitted my talk proposal and when I made the slides for this, I decided I don't actually like the word democratization very much. So you'll notice that it's not in the title, but this is that talk. Um, I'm Ben Eggers. Um, I'm an SRE at Google, which is a site reliability engineer. And so we are basically the team that is responsible for keeping Google running uh, at all times. Um, we're a fairly small percentage of Google's engineering organization. Um, and a lot of this talk is actually going to be an explanation of what SRE is and like kind of how Google does ops and stays running and does all of that. Um, and it turns out that that's how we keep our things running and how we keep the cloud running. Um, I work on Google Cloud Platform. So I am one of the people who keeps the cloud running ideally for everyone. Um, sometimes who does not do that. Um, we're going to talk about what the cloud is, uh, why it's great, why it's not great, um, where I kind of think it's going, um, and how, like I said, like how kind of Google does ops and runs the cloud and you know all that. And then if we have time at the end, oh, it's not on this. If we have time at the end, um, I am going to talk about some notable outages that Google has had. Um, so you know, Google's Google's pretty big. We've failed in some pretty spectacular ways, and a lot of those uh, ways have been uh, approved for public talks. Um, we don't we don't we don't often like put blog posts or anything about them. So you kind of have to usually go to a talk by someone who works at Google who's like willing to talk about these things. Um, so I have some good war stories for you. So at the very end, we'll do questions, or I have like a list of those, and so you can ask me about those or ask about this. I think that's how we'll kind of do questions. Um, also, anytime, feel free to like. Raise your hand or just shout out. Uh, I'm happy to like go as off the rails as you guys want to like with whatever we're talking about. So I have you know this is my talk is like kind of an outline. We can we can we can do whatever we want. So um, first, I need to say uh, this talk is actually kind of two talks. So one of them uh, is me Ben Eggers, like someone who works in tech who's not necessarily affiliated with Google, um, talking about the cloud and computing and where the cloud is going and what it all means. And then kind of dropped in the middle, there's this uh, kind of approved Google pre-made, here's what SRE is, here's what we do, and here's how we do it. Um, and so because, I mean, because we kind of, you know, we do things a very particular way and it's often kind of confidential and, you know, things have to be approved for publication, um, I, have, I have the approved, you know, here's, here's what I would like to say. And that's in the middle and I'll make sure that I very clearly delimit where my opinion ends and where kind of the googly things begin and then where that ends and my opinion begins again. Um, and that's just important for me to do as someone who works for Google and you know, wants to keep his job. Um, <laughs> so first, uh, before we can actually get to what the cloud is, I think it makes sense for us to talk about how we got where we are today. Because um, you, know, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been, position, velocity, something. Um, so let's you know, put it into perspective. We started in 1702. Uh, Leibniz, this guy with like fabulous hair, um, he was the very first person to talk about binary, which you know I think I think most people may know like binary is kind of the how, how computers think about things, how they, how computers store numbers and data and information of all sorts. And Leibniz was the first person who said, oh, we can break decisions down to this like yes or no, and we can break all these more complex decisions into a series of yeses or nos. And he was like maybe not right, but you know kind of laid the foundation. And then uh, in 1936 we get Alan Turing, and he's like basically a mathematician. And he was thinking about computability and numbers. And you know, you, maybe maybe you guys have heard of a Turing machine, this like thing that computers supposedly are. Um, so that was 1936, which is 224 years after Leibniz. And he says, "Oh, we have this neat thing that can do this neat thing called computation." Um, but it's still just very theoretical. Um, and so then in the 40s, we have uh, actual computers kind of actually being built, and we get this guy Claude Shannon who really applies. Leibniz's binary stuff to Turing's computer stuff and starts to talk in kind of a more formal and sensible way about what information is and information theory and how computers can store information. Um, and that's kind of where we actually start to really worry about optimizing these machines and what they can, what they can and can't compute and how efficiently and how we can store it. Um, and then we get von Neumann and he is like, you know, he worked on the Manhattan Project. I mean, the dude's like, unbelievable scientist and mathematician. Um, but he was the one who very first uh, came up with this idea of having a processing unit and some RAM and some IO devices. And he kind of 
when you when you see any block diagram of how a computer works today, that's a von Neumann architecture, and we owe, so we we owe a lot to him as like computer people who use computers. Um, and then we get these neat things called transistors, and suddenly like the the, the logic gates that are used in computers go from this big to like this big, um, and then they keep getting smaller and smaller. Um, you know, you've all heard of like Moore's law. This is like almost pre Moore's law. This is like enabling Moore's law. And then we get microprocessors. Um, and microprocessors, I know we're just like speeding through history, it's just like to get a little bit of perspective, right? Um, microprocessors are these tiny little things that have huge amounts of logic in them, and so we can go from like a room this size full of, full of you know, vacuum tubes to like a tiny little chip that can do the same amount of stuff. Um, and then we have everyone's favorite operating system here, Windows. Um, <laughs> Personal computers get really big, and you know people suddenly all have personal computers. And this is when uh, Bill Gates has his famous, you know, no one should ever need more than like four kilobytes of RAM. Um, um, and this kind of represents something, right? Suddenly everyone's got a computer. You know, we've gone from we've gone from uh, this like weird math construct to these like tiny little things, right? And then we end up with with this, uh, right? And so then in 2004, Google goes public. We have this internet explosion. You'll notice that. Uh, on this chart, these are actually multiples of 10, so this is a log scale. And so um, you can see around like, you know, between like 1988 and 2000, we just like, the number, of, the number of things on the internet grows by like several orders of magnitude, and it's still growing. And it's kind of maybe slowing down some, but I mean, it's still growing like absurdly quickly. Um, it's just that this scale gets really big. Um, and now we have all these like social media sites, right? And we have all these like, uh, you know, Gmail, you're shaking your head like, is, is it? Uh, yik -yak? Yik yeah, yeah, I mean, it still exists probably, right? Uh, is, anyone, is, is anyone here on Yik Yak? Can I just show hands? <laughs> all right, no, <laughs> lots of heads shaking. Um, yeah, we should all get on Yik Yak next year for Linux Fest Northwest. <laughs> and, like, uh, make, it, make it happen again. The, the people will be looking at their graphs, they'll be like, oh shit, coming back. <laughs> um, but anyway, now, now we have all this like social media, right? Um, and then in 2020, right, everyone, 2020, year of Linux on desktop, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, <laughs> but the point is, the point is, we went from this dude with this hair, with this beautiful hair, to this crazy math thing in, like, the Turing machine in, like, 200 years. And then in less than 80 years, we went from this, like, crazy math thing to Google and to Facebook and to Amazon, right? Turing published his paper in which he said, Here's how we can maybe think of computation in 1936, and it's 2017. That's 90, 81, 81 years. Okay, so yeah, go to Google in less than 80 years. Um, and the point is this like unbelievable rate of acceleration, right? We went from math to these big vacuum tubes, to these tiny transistors, to these really tightly packed microchips to, 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 to our phones and to Google and to Facebook. Um, and so, so the takeaways are basically we have this absurd acceleration, um, and things are getting more accessible, right? We've gone from an academic to an engineer, to everyone. everyone. Everyone kind of has a phone now, and maybe you can't program it, and you can't use it kind of in the way that people who, I don't know, like Turing, Turing really understood his Turing machine, so maybe he could do more with a Turing machine than you can do with your phone if there were some way to compare them. But the point is that everyone can use this technology now. Um, and that kind of represents something, probably. Um, <laughs> But we still have this problem that like, you know, you have a phone, but if you wanna actually build a website that gets like, like hundreds or thousands or millions of, of queries per second or of users or of visitors, you need all this like massive infrastructure, right? You can't serve a website like that from your phone um, or, or from your computer or even from like your computer and all of your friends' computers. You need, you need to like pour your own concrete and build your own servers and kind of do all that. Um, and the question is, how can we make this more accessible? So if like this guy here who shook his head when I said Yik Yak wants to like build something like a better version of Yik Yak, um, how, how is he going to do that and where is he going to store his data? Um, and if you're here then you can probably predict what my answer is. <laughs> the cloud. Um, yeah, you guys are less excited than I thought you'd be. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Um, but what is the cloud? Um, show of hands, who here like thinks they kind of vaguely know like what the cloud is or why it matters? You'd be surprised, actually. Some people you ask that, and they're like, somebody else's computer. Basically, yeah. I asked my mom, and she's like, I don't know. Like, Google keeps my photos somewhere. Probably. Uh, she's a lawyer. <laughs> Lawyers. Um, okay. So the cloud can be thought of as infrastructure for rent, right? So the point is, like, when when this guy, wa I'm sorry. Can I get your name? Can I? Jesse. Okay. Can I continue to use you as an Absolutely. example? Okay. So when Jesse wants to replace Yik Yak. Um, 
Jesse doesn't want to pour his own concrete and build his own servers, and then when his app inevitably goes out of business because any replacement for Yik Yak is also going to die, um, <laughs> like he's he's lost a ton of money, right? I mean, or more likely he's lost VCs a bunch of money. Um, but Jesse has a conscience, and so he doesn't want to lose VCs a bunch of money. Um, and so the point is that instead of doing that, one one company or one group of people can own all of the infrastructure, and Jesse can pay them to use their infrastructure, right? And so Jesse can say, hey, I want to rent a server. Um, and then as soon as Jesse goes out of business, he doesn't have to rent the server anymore. Um, or when he gets wildly successful, he can continue scaling up very quickly. And um, one of the one of the what I think really cool features of the cloud is that people don't often talk about unless they're kind of like really directly using cloud computing, is that you have these like really different levels of control, right? So on the one hand, you can just get like raw VMs, and this is something that like Google and Microsoft and Facebook all offer, where you can basically say, hey, I want to rent machines. I want you to give me this many machines with this many cores and this much RAM, and I'm going to SSH into them and manage them all myself. Or you can go a little bit to the left here. And you can have like a cluster manager. And so, does anyone here know what Kubernetes is? Sure. Okay. Like yes. Yeah, so, so that's thank you. Um, so you can you can then instead of just having raw machines, you can have kind of a, a managed cluster on top of your machines that you can use, but you still have a lot of configuration options. Or you can go all the way to the left, and we have this cool thing called App Engine. Like shameless plug, um, I support App Engine, um, where basically you give us your code. And it just runs. And when you start, and you can say, okay, as soon as any of my machines are running at more than, you know, 50% uh, CPU capacity, I want more. And so, you know, you can go from like building your crappy Yik Yak replacement. I'm sorry, your awesome Yik Yak replacement. <laughs> um, and then as soon as it like really starts to blow up on like college campuses, um, then you know, you you just you can you can wake up in the morning and have four times as many machines, and you can you're still serving your queries without, you know, if you just have. Pure, pure servers and it blows up while you're asleep, then you, know, you start to just drop queries. Whereas if you wanna, want us to manage it, we can manage it for you. And this is actually also a really cool thing. Um, because especially, especially as you get more in the managed direction, you allow kind of anyone who can write any web app or any piece of code to scale up and to, to uh, get users kind of much more easily without having to worry about exactly all of the low level configuration of all of their machines. And so, and so it's almost, uh, it's almost like outsourcing your, your ops and outsourcing all of your uh, machine management. Um, is everyone with me so far? Do we have any questions? Complaints? Jesse says no. Okay, so um, it's worth mentioning here, Google has its own internal cloud. So we have like a bunch of our, we have, you know, we offer our cloud products, right? But we have a bunch of our own internal servers, obviously. Um, and it turns out that we also basically have a version of the cloud on it. It's called Borg. Um, I'm not really gonna talk about it. There's a site reliability engineering book where we go in a lot of detail about what Borg is and actually how Google's data centers work. Um, it's really cool, but it's not what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm just mentioning it because this talk, at least the kind of democratization of computing part is about public clouds, like AWS, Azure GCP, uh, that's Google Cloud Platform. We're a small cloud provider, you may have heard of us. Um, um, this talk is about public clouds, however, we, Google, run our internal cloud the same way that we run our external cloud. And so later I'm going to talk about kind of site reliability engineering and how Google does reliability engineering. And that applies to the cloud and all of our kind of proprietary products and how we run our internal cloud. Um, so we're kind of taking the, the years of wisdom and horrible outages that we've had doing web search and ads and everything and we're applying that to our cloud products in hopes that we can get more reliability. Yes? Yeah, do your internal cloud violate your definition of what the cloud is? Uh, <laughs> so I would, I would define, yeah, I would define a cloud as a large set of computers that are managed by someone else and that you, in general, have uh, different levels of configurability to run your code on. And in that sense, Google has its own internal cloud. Because um, we have a large number of machines and, and you know, you don't, this is all in much more detail in the, in the site reliability engineering book. But basically, when I want to run a job at Google, I don't need to go and find a machine and put my job on that machine. Because of how frequently machines die, we basically have a huge cluster manager, um, kind of like Kubernetes, uh, again, for like the four people who knew what Kubernetes was. Um, and that's, that's what Borg is. Borg, basically, you give it like the equivalent of a Docker container and you say, run this for me, and it has these constraints. Um, so we have engineers running our internal cloud, um, but I would still count that as an internal cloud. But as far as, as far as making computing accessible to other people go, that obviously doesn't quite count because you know, it's restricted to Google engineers and we're not quite everyone. Um, that was a good question though, thank you. Sorry? 
Uh, do we do we any any more? Okay. Um, let's talk about good things about the cloud. We've already kind of alluded to some of them. How are we on time? We've already kind of alluded to some of them. Um, you don't have to pour your own concrete. You don't have to build your own or buy your own hardware. You don't have to manage your own hardware if you don't want to, but if you want to, you can. Um, one thing that's often talked about that's pretty cool is that you have access to these like world class libraries. So like, I think all three major cloud providers. I know Google, but I don't. I'm not for sure on AWS or Azure. Provide like really cool machine learning libraries that are built by these like world class machine learning experts and really cool kind of distributed databases that are like. You know, like we have Spanner that depends on atomic clocks for synchronization. And like, you know, you're not going to put your own atomic clocks in your data centers, but you don't have to because you can use ours um, for a fee. Um, and you get access to these like really cool, uh, really cutting edge technologies uh, without having to actually do it all yourself. And the, whole, and the whole point is that, you know, Jesse can really have great machine learning on his Yik Yak posts um, <laughs> if he wants to figure out what his users are thinking. Um, and you don't have to do your own ops. And so when security uh, vulnerabilities are found, you don't have to wake up at 2 a.m. and spend you know, several hours all hands on deck upgrading all of your kernels. Um, you don't have to you know, scale up your machines if you don't want to. You, kind of just don't, you, you, you don't have to worry about it all if you don't want to. Um, and, that's, and that's kind of a really cool thing, right? That makes it much more accessible. Um, but it has its downsides. We all knew it was coming. Um, there's a single point of failure. So like, what happens in the unlikely event that like, all of AWS goes down? Um, that's never happened, right? <laughs> um, or what happens even worse if like, a major security vulnerability is found in AWS or, or GCP or Azure, right? Um, then suddenly we're talking about not just one company's data, but a lot of companies' data. And so you know, we all invest super heavily in security, obviously, whatever. But you know, talking as Ben, uh, the person, not someone who works at Google, like, this, is, this is a worrisome thing from a security perspective, right? Um, this is something that you at least have to consider when you when you build things on the cloud. Is what what happens? You know, like what if what if some weird vulnerability is found in the uh, x86 instruction set that causes a kernel to hang when a VM is running on it? Um, that happened a couple of years ago. You know, if if it hadn't been found by Intel and reported to us, like you know, in enough time for us to fix it, someone could have basically brought down like all of the major cloud providers and everyone running on them. And that's like a whole lot of infrastructure. Um, this is like a worrisome. Yeah, um, that's that's publicly. Yeah. Um, and we also have the consolidation of data, um, which, is, which is kind of the same thing, but it's a single point of failure uh, from, from a slightly different perspective, which is that I know that a lot of people here are concerned, to say the least, about privacy and about the government and about this collections and these machine learning things. Uh, and the consolidation of like, everyone's data in one place makes the NSA very happy. Um, and it makes us all kind of unhappy. Um, and so, you know, one, one cool thing, for example, that Apple is doing uh, for their cloud is they're actually encrypting things on their cloud with a key that is only found in your devices um, and is recoverable somehow. But basically, Apple doesn't have access to your data. And for a lot of, a lot of our Google Cloud products, we don't even have access to your data. Um, so we, we take these concerns very seriously, but they still are definitely concerns. Um, and, you know, there's no, there's no kind of getting around that. Um, is that. Is that a hand or? No. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, the question that I would put to you all as Linuxy security, kind of privacy sensitive people is how much do these cons matter? Um, and I know that the answer that you want to believe and you want to say and that I want to believe and say is that they matter a lot. Um, but in some sense, like this has kind of been an inevitable push, right? This, oh yeah, you're here, so probably you do. But this has kind of been an inevitable push. And so if we look at, if we look at history, um, people kind of, people value, uh, ease of use and convenience over a lot of these privacy concerns. And that's something that I don't know if any number of Linux fests will change. And I think it's very important to have people kind of like this group who are thinking about these problems. But it, I don't think it's fair to say, oh, look, the consolidation of data is bad. Therefore, the cloud is bad. And just leave it at that. We kind of have to talk about how we can use our opinions on that and our feelings about that to make the cloud better and to make the data less accessible to people and to kind of mitigate the fact that there's a single point of failure for a lot of infrastructure. Um, yeah. So with that said, with my, with my opining on the cloud out of the way, if there are no questions or concerns or complaints about that, I will move into the kind of Google section of my talk, which is what is site reliability engineering and how do we keep our stuff running? So, my question. Yeah. So, on the single point of failure, 
terms of sophistication. And uh, what about federation of data? Would like we have good uh, blockchain technologies coming along that perhaps would allow us to share the data in different ways. Uh, for example, maybe Google could like share its data with AWS and with Azure to get like a three-way backup or something along those lines. Um, so you're saying like, you're saying like someone stores something in Google and just in case we go down, we like replicate things across AWS and Azure. Yeah. So that's something, that's actually a very good question um, and I wanted to talk about, that's, that's often referred to as multi-cloud. Um, and that's something that I wanted to talk about in this talk um, but did, decided that I probably didn't have time to. Um, but a lot of people these days are, are replicating their data across multiple cloud providers and, and a lot of people are even doing their own private kind of on-premises, they're pouring their own concrete and putting their own hardware in it and then they're also using these cloud compute, this cloud computing infrastructure. Um, I think for various like businessy and producty reasons, uh, we probably <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I can speculate, um, but I think I think it's on users to replicate um, their data in that way. And there and there are actually some really cool open source projects um, that are that are kind of trying to make it easier to deploy on like multi cloud uh, services. So Spinnaker is one. Uh, it's two N's and a K. Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. I think that is like a very good mitigation strategy. The question then is one of uh, less privacy and more kind of data spread, right? And that's something that I think a lot of users and companies have to decide on their own. Yeah, because you could get more complications here. Right, and then you have to keep all the systems talking to each other, and yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I just wonder if I misunderstood, did you indicate that Apple, or said that Apple is providing uh, cloud service to I don't think they're providing cloud computing service services, but they have their like iCloud where they yeah. store photos and stuff, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, as far as I know, they don't offer cloud computing, but I'm hesitant to say that because I, you know, competitor speculation and whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the three the three big cloud providers that I'm aware of are like AWS, Microsoft, and GCP. Um, yeah. But I was just I was just commenting that Apple has you know they they store they back up users' photos in their cloud and they they basically they have they've been rolling out or I remember reading something about their plans to roll out maybe this new kind of encryption where even they can't don't have access to your photos and that's kind of in response to a lot of the recent uh, privacy concerns surrounding in particular Apple devices but just in general. Any more? Yeah. Um, what do you mean by my own opinion? Um, so I don't want to be any sort of architecture consultant, but I will say that if I ran my own company, um, I would probably feel better having a multi-cloud setup because of all the things we've talked about, single point of failure and data replication. Um, also, you know, various cloud providers, uh, have different points of presence in different parts of the world, and so you can get better latency maybe to users by deploying with one cloud provider in one region and another cloud provider in another region. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked into how much it costs to build your own data center, so I don't know if I could say that I would do that. Like, it sounds cool, um, but, you know. Yeah. Um, I've heard that term called the fog. Sorry? Um, I've heard a term called the fog. Like meant to be kind of somewhere between the way that cloud and traditional computing. Because um, you've got the kind of dichotomy of like you know, cloud laptops and then regular data centers and stuff. Right. Do you, do you know anything about that? Or? Um, I know very little about it. I know that I visited a website a while ago that put some JavaScript in my browser that was using me to mine Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. Um, it's hard to be mad, but when it's clever, but it, you know. Um, Would you like I, me to answer this question? Yeah, yeah, please, if you have things to say. Yeah, so cloud computing is the idea, it's the, it's the cloud of IoT, IoT being the Internet of Things. So the idea is that when you do large scale networks, like um, a network that would inter interconnect all the uh, traffic signals in the city, for example, it's very hard to have lots of bandwidth to all those points in a large area. And so what you do is, instead of doing what you would do in a traditional environment where you would send all the data to the cloud and all the processing in the cloud with a FOD topology, you put a little bit more compute in all those places, every light bulb, for example, 
and you, you put more intelligence there so that only post-analysis data gets sent via those very slow, very low power links to, to the cloud. So that's what the public can do. So it sounds like what you're saying is that instead of having a consolidated decision-making place with networks reaching out everywhere, we distribute it and because we have worse networks between them. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, we'll move on to the slides that I didn't make. Um, the next few are formatted weirdly. I couldn't fix them, um, but they, they were neat enough that I thought I would put them in. Um, we'll talk about how Google runs things. Um, yeah, we're leaving, we're leaving Ben's opinion and kind of, you know, standing up here talking to you as Ben, and I'm now kind of representing Google as a Google SRE. Um, it's a different hat. I should have brought my Noodler hat. Um, anyway, this is uh, Google uh, a while ago. Actually, yeah, 20 years ago. Um, and then we started getting users. And then we finally had, our, had a great a data center. We actually were, we had servers somewhere, and that was very exciting. Um, I, I'm including these mainly because uh, I, think, I think it's just really neat um, to see, like, you know, I was just saying, if you build your Yik Yak replacement, you can't serve it off of your phone or off of your computer. But if you look, like, that's exactly what Larry and Sergey were doing um, for a little while. So it's kind of funny. Now you don't have to, thankfully, but you still can. Um, but, you know, this is, this is almost, this is almost an, uh, an argument in favor of the cloud because you no longer have to do this, right? You no longer have to worry about your machine always being connected to the Internet. Um, and so this, this is also a, a little bit of a, of a parable slash math problem that explains why we kind of need the type of uh, reliability engineering that Google has. Um, with 10,000 servers, we expect about 10, fa or 10 failures a day, assuming that a server stays up for 1,000 days. Uh, these numbers are approximate, mostly fictional. They're not based on our data at Google. Um, these are just kind of, this is just kind of illustrative numbers to make the example. Um, so with the first year in a new cluster, uh, I'll, I'll let you guys basically just read this. Um, but everything breaks when you have as many computers as Google has. Um, you know, like you never expect the hard disk on your on your uh, laptop to die. But when you've got like as many hard disks as Google's got, you expect them to die um, early and often and all the time. Um, we have this we have this uh, saying: pets versus cattle. And so we say that like your phone or your laptop, they're kind of pets. And when they get sick, you want to nurse them back to health and fix them and figure out what's wrong. Um, all of our servers at Google, we think of as cattle. You know, when they, when they get sick, you gotta just shoot them. Um, <laughs> you, can't, you can't nurse, you know, if you've got, got 10,000 cattle and one of them gets sick, you can't stop the cattle drive. Um, so you kind of need, you need that type of engineering. Um, and it has to come from software. Because if you're, if you're trying to uh, engineer reliability at the hardware level, hardware always fails. Even if you get your hardware to you know, fail twi uh, in twice as much time or three times as much time or ten times as much time as current commercial hardware fails, you still, when you hit Google, failure, uh, Google scale, you still fail all the time. Um, everything breaks. You can't depend on anything working. So you have to engineer software systems to handle that, basically. Um, so. To do that, you get these people called SREs, um, Site Reliability Engineers, which is what I am. Um, our, prob our, our problem space is keep Google running. Um, you know, there are various teams. I think it, there's an there's a organizational structure slide later. Um, but reliability is basically the, the, the number one feature when you hit Google scale, right? Um, when, you're, when you're starting, when you're a new social media app or you're a new whatever, your, your features have to be kind of interesting ways that people can connect with people. And if it's down sometimes, you know, you get shit for it, but it's not that bad. Um, when you hit Google scale, the number one thing that we need to do basically is work, um, the way that people expect us to work. Um, and that's kind of one of our, one of our really top priorities as a company. Um, and the, 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 the rhetorical question is, do you like Gmail 2016 or Gmail 500? Um, <laughs> and it's easy to take for granted. Um, you know, you don't, you don't notice when things are working as expected, usually. Um, lately, there's, there's been a little bit more questioning of like, how does Google work? Um, when I, you know, I go to Google to check if my internet works. Um, how do they do that? Uh, so, so lately, people have been taking it a little bit less for granted. But in general, um, things working is not something that you notice. And that's kind of like a point, a point of pride for us. Um, people, people often don't realize that we exist. So um, if, I, if, if we had to define it, we would say uh, the goal is to work at a huge scale and balance kind of reliability and uh, availability, um, sorry, balance reliability and availability with kind of feature velocity and new services. And we solve all of our problems with software. 
Um, so I'll talk about this later, but basically everyone who is a, pretty much everyone who is a site reliability engineer at Google could write code at Google instead. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a very kind of fundamentally different way of looking at ops, um, because when you get to Google scale, you can't do ops by SSHing into a machine. Uh, you gotta shoot the cattle, you can't, you can't nurse it back to health. Um, and we're not purely operational. So, so our, goal, our goal is not just to keep things running and to do kind of ops. Our goal is actually to, over time, improve the reliability of the services. And so um, a, common, a common thing that you'll see is that you know, we'll onboard a new service that site reliability as we'll, we'll start to we'll start to kind of engage with a new service that's been written and is now kind of in the wild. Um, and in the beginning, we'll say, OK, you know, we kind of need to improve monitoring. We need to do this and that and this and that. And then five years down the road, it's just this very mature, very reliable service that works almost all the time kind of with very little manual inter intervention. And that's kind of our job is to kind of take services in and slowly over time improve them. Um, yeah, and we're, and we're on call. Um, so we, we get paged when things break. Um, I was on call last week and I'm on call next week. <laughs> and do you get calls? Uh, yeah. Pages. <laughs> Pages, calls, yeah. Um, if I miss what the page. The, the, your, uh, traditional ops team? Sorry? What do you mean by traditional ops team? Um, so we have, I guess, I guess I would say we don't have them, and their responsibilities are kind of evenly split between hardware ops, the people in the data centers, and site reliability engineers. Um, so we have people in our data centers, right? Like machines break, and you need to like replace the hardware. Um, or you need to like install new racks, and like there are people who do that, of course. Um, and those people often do a lot of this kind of checking, and maybe we, you would consider as like like traditional ops. Um, but in terms of like rolling out new versions of the code and rolling back versions of the code and thinking about where the data is replicated and where the database lives and what happens if this goes down or if we get this many queries from this region of the world, that's kind of the realm of site reliability engineers. Um, and what about OS upgrades? That's SRE. Yeah, we, we run all of the software, basically. Yeah. Do you do follow us on, uh, on call location? Um, when you say you're on call, does that mean that you're getting called at 2 a.m.? Yeah, so location? we'll talk we'll talk about this later. Okay. Typically, typically what we go for is um, either one rotation of eight people in one location and they're on call 24-7, or ideally we uh, have, yeah, a split team where uh, people are on call for 12 hours a day. So I'm lucky to be on one of the services where I'm on call for 12 hours a day. And I have like a week long shift of you know 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And that's not so bad. I'm like pretty tired by 10 p.m. because I'm, I'm more of an old man than I look, but. Um, and so anyway, uh, are there any more questions? Sorry. Okay, so SRE, we kind of, we kind of actually do this in-depth problem solving. A lot of times um, what like ops teams will do is they'll, you know, something's broken. Oh, we'll just roll back to a previous version or oh, we'll just, you know, uh, connect this computer to this one to get more hard disk space or whatever, we will actually go through, we'll, we'll roll back or we'll kind of mitigate, but then we'll go and look at the code and we'll try to figure out what exactly went wrong and where all the retries were coming from. And sometimes we'll even, you know, we, we write a good amount of code and so we'll, we'll often submit code to fix these problems. Um, and we consult. So uh, I've, I've heard it said that the kind of fundamental thing of SRE is that operational experience feeds back into system design. Um, and so the point is when you hire coders and people who could kind of be software engineers to do ops and reliability, you can go talk to the software engineers and say, hey, like you architected things this way and that's really bad for this reason, can you can we change it to this? Um, and then we'll often help with the implementation as well um, by developing software. And we onboard new services. You know, we always, we're always taking on more stuff and kind of trying to fix things up more. And we're on call. Um, so our main, our main kind of on-call thing, the way that we measure reliability is this SLO, this service level objective. Um, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, but yeah, we, we, are, we are the ops people, um, but we also write code. Well, where is the, uh, when you fix things, our DevOps? Does it exist in Google? Yeah, so I, I think the way that it's typically described in relation to SRE is that DevOps is a set of principles, and it's kind of this, uh, it's, it's the idea of having software type people do the ops, and SRE is an instantiation of DevOps. Um, so SRE is kind of what we call DevOps because we were calling it that before DevOps became a term. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're DevOps. Yeah? Do you like have an old school pager, or is? I have, a, I have an app on my phone. <laughs> <laughs>
Some people, I think there's there's one guy on my team who carries a pager around. I don't know if he gets paged on it for on-call issues. What do you uh, use a pager to do? Uh, we have a proprietary, we like wrote a thing, you know. <laughs> we build a lot of our own stuff. <laughs> um, any other? Yeah. What, uh, what's the background? Your background and the, the, the average background of this. Or did you, you have a degree in computer science? Were you trying to be a developer? Yeah, so I have degrees in computer science and math. Um, and I was originally actually going to join Google as a software engineer. And then my recruiter was like, have you considered this SRE thing? Like, you did well in your networks class. And I was like, oh yeah, that does sound neat. Um, and it's pretty neat. Um, we have a lot of people, uh, I won't, we could go like infinitely deep here. Um, we have a lot of people of various different backgrounds. I know a guy who was a data center, he didn't graduate high school, he was a data center tech, and then he moved into SRE, and now he's like a high, pretty high level, like very respected SRE. And we have people with PhDs in computer science. I mean, we have people who came over from the software engineering side after 10 years and decided that they kind of thought DevOps and SRE were neat. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I haven't been at Google or kind of in industry for long enough to really say, but I know that a lot of SREs, we, we kind of pride ourselves on having people of very different backgrounds and really actually being uh, a meritocracy, um, or you know, it's hard to actually establish a meritocracy, but it's, we're, it is overall very meritocratic, and in general people in SRE don't even talk about their backgrounds. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't know that a guy uh, who I worked with had a PhD for a long time, and then he's like, yeah, like when I was doing my PhD in data, distributed database management, and I was like, oh, no wonder you do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, thank you. Okay, um, and then one, one, a couple other uh, really kind of fundamental features of SRE is that we actually do, we develop code in exactly the way that everyone else develops code um, at Google, and so, we go through all the reviews and we have to write unit tests um, even though we hate it. We have to write documentation even though we hate it. Um, but yeah, we, we kind of have, we kind of, we hold ourselves to the same standards of engineering. Um, so it's not like, um, I think something that you see at some companies is like, you know, you have the software engineers who write their beautiful code that makes the world turn and they have their unit tests and their, uh, you know, code reviews and these great architecture diagrams. And then you have the sysadmins who have all these like grungy scripts that they've written to like do all the stuff and make, make sure things work. That's not how we do things in SRE. We build high quality tools that are kind of Google engineering, uh, up to the Google engineering standard. And that means that they often take longer to build, but that means that a tool that was built 10 years ago still works just as well today. Um, and we have some tools that are that old that we use all the time, you know? Um, and when, it, when it's well written, it's easy to extend. Um, and you know, there's all the code extensibility, whatever. Um, how are we on time? Okay, I'm gonna have to speed through parts of this. So the SRE organizational structure, we are an independent organization within Google Engineering. Um, so that means that, for example, there are, there are the products that like my team supports. Uh, and there are the software engineers for those products. And our reporting chains are almost entirely disjoint. Um, our, our reporting chains intersect like very, very high up, but that kind of, that kind of means that their, their VP who really wants to like launch this product, for example, can't come to me and say, hey, you really gotta, like, you know, I know it's a little unreliable, but we really gotta launch, right? If, if someone who's, you know, my manager like four levels up comes to me and says, hey, don't worry about that, we really gotta launch, I'm probably gonna listen to him. But if someone, some guy who's like not in my reporting chain is like, we really gotta launch, I can say, you know, sorry, my job is to make sure that it's reliable and I don't think it's reliable. Um, so we're kind of a separate organization within Google Engineering, uh, deliberately. Uh, and in general, an SRE team is organized around a certain set of technologies. So you, know, you have the search SRE teams, um, and you have the Gmail SRE team, and you have you know, the cloud SRE teams who support maybe one or two cloud products. Um, and services are jointly owned by Dev and SRE. So this is, this is something that I think is also a little bit later, but that is a problem in a lot of places I hear where software engineers write the code and then they just kind of throw it over the wall to ops and ops is responsible for, yeah, I'm seeing some, some nods, um, and ops is responsible for like rolling it out and making sure it works and they may not even know what's new in the code, for example. Um, SRE is not that way. We, we all have access to the code. We all uh, add code and add write features. Um, SREs are by design kind of a, a scarce resource and so we have the right to say like, this sucks, I'm leaving. You know, like I don't want to be on this team anymore because I get paged 20 times a shift. Um, and so because of that, you kind of have this self-regulating system where devs, devs want to launch, but they really want to keep their SREs in the loop because if the SREs feel like they're not being kept in the loop, we just leave. Um, and that happens, so. So your SRE, are they carved out or are they silent? Do you sit in on Scrum, stand up on different teams, on different initiatives, or do they come to you and then uh, they go through Jira, for example? 
Um, the normal ticketing system. Are you, you go out, sit up, wake up at five in the morning, talk with the India team, or do they come to you? You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't follow up. Sorry. Okay. Team gets together. Also the which team. which team? Any team. Like a software engineering team. No, I don't mean a software engineering team. I mean a team working on a project. Okay. The team gets up. They're going to do their stand up. They want to necessarily be present. They want to necessarily be your guide, and they want to know what to look ahead. Is that how it works? I or see. do they work as a team, and then they send off whatever they've got to the SRE? I see. So in general, um, for those for those who didn't hear, the question was like. If we want to build, a, if a team wants to build a product and they want, say, an SRE kind of to help them consult, do they bring it? To, do they bring an SRE into like their stand up and their scrum and kind of have them from the beginning, or do they kind of build this design doc and then send it off to the SREs um, who exist? Um, and the answer is a mix of both. So, for example, my uh, software engineering teams. I'm an SRE for a couple of products. My software engineering teams sit uh, fairly close to me, and so I will often just go walk over to them and say, "Hey, let's chat about that design." It's kind of a very low uh, effort proposition. Um, half of my team, like I said, is very far away. And so in that case, usually when you get a full design doc, you'll send it to the SRE team's mailing list and say, can someone take a look at this? Um, a lot of products, some products don't have SRE support, and so these software engineering teams don't actually have like dedicated SREs to their product. Um, there are some kind of more free roaming SREs in the company who those teams can ping and say, hey, we're kind of developing this new big thing and we want someone who has some reliability expertise, can you, can you come help us with this? And they'll maybe do like a short engagement to help that team out. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. And headcount, um, this is an important piece for the self-regulating system bit. Uh, headcount actually comes from the product area. So for every SRE that supports a product, there's one less software engineer, um, which kind of means that you are making it in, from, from, from even like a VP, you know, from a high level perspective, you're making an investment in reliability. You're saying, instead of having this many software engineers writing this many features, we want to have, we want to cut off a portion of them to be purely focused on reliability. Um, uh, question. Yeah. Can I ask if the uh, SRE actually provides more like a broad of knowledge? Like, um, uh, we pride ourselves on being generalists, yeah. But it's questionable whether that's true. Uh, <laughs> then the software engineer, that's my question. Yeah, so I mean the way, the way that, uh, I've heard it talked about a couple times is that like software engineers go really deep in their in their code and they have these like really deep design ideas and they kind of they really design well but they end up with a blob of code they end up with a binary that, that regardless of how it's designed and how it's implemented there's this like piece of code and we have a bunch of pieces of code living in Google's data centers and we want to replace those with this and the the problem of doing that safely and kind of automatically and rolling it back and everything is is SRE so I mean it we, we do a lot of like remote debugging and a lot of kind of lower level stuff and then we do a lot of coding and so I, I think I, I would say in general that it probably requires a more general skill set, but I'm definitely biased. I think SRE is a kind of like a combination of uh, SWE plus QA, you know? Uh, plus uh, systemic. Yeah, basically. Like, uh, three, three things plus together. Yeah, that's not that's not a bad way to put it. <laughs> um, okay, we're gonna fly through this. So I think we've already talked about how it's different from typical software engineering. Uh, so the main the main thing that we're trying to solve in SRE is this is this dev and ops divide, right? Uh, and we talked about that. Dev wants to write features and roll them out and get the, get users using it, and ops wants everything to work. And Historically, you know, dev writes features, throws it over the wall to ops, and ops kind of deals with it and gets paged and gets woken up at 2 a.m. And there's a little bit of this, like, bad feeling, bad blood. Um, development have, has its own lingo. You know, people, software engineers will have computer science degrees, and they have these experiments and A-B tests and UI, whatever. And ops also has its own, uh, has its own uh, parlance that's different. Um, and to make it harder, like ops doesn't know the code base, and the team that knows the least about the code has the strongest incentive to stop it from launching, right? So dev says, hey, we have all these new features, and they're really excited, and ops is like, every time you've said that, I've gotten woken up at 2 in the morning. Why would I launch this? Um, and so it's, it, it makes sense. It, it's, you can see how we start to want kind of software engineers doing ops, because we kind of understand, oh, these new features are cool, and here's how they're written, and here's what's happening, and here's what changes I'm making. Um, is conflict inevitable? No. Um, Many people believe that. I would say I'm one of them. Um, it certainly seems easier to have 
people who understand software uh, doing ops than kind of more traditional ops people. I shouldn't say people who understand software, but people who have been trained and kind of could be software engineers and kind of get that world. Um, and the way that we enforce things and prevent, there's, there's still this question of SRE is responsible. If SRE gets paged, then the question is like, SRE doesn't like getting paged, obviously. You know, no one likes getting paged. So how do we decide when to launch? How do we decide when to roll out new features? And so if Dev's like, hey, we got all these new features, when does SRE say yes and when do they say no? And if it's kind of this random decision-making process where it's just like, eh, I don't feel like it, then you get this conflict, right? And so we have this notion of an error budget and an SLA. Um, an SLA is an agreement between us and you um, where we basically say, we're going to be this available. We're going to respond to 99.95% of queries um, within this amount of time. And our 50 percentile latency is going to be this, and our 90th percentile is going to be this, whatever. Um, with all major cloud providers, you basically have an SLA that says, here is how available your machines are going to be, and here's what your latency is going to be. And if we violate this, we'll give you back your money. Um, and, and it makes sense that people would want this uh, who are using cloud computing, right? You don't want to say, okay, Google's running my code, but you know, if it breaks, they're just going to be like, sorry. Um, <laughs> like, that's, no one likes to hear that. And so you can say, oh, if it breaks this badly, I'll get my money back. And like, that makes me feel better about giving them my money. Um, I, I at least have some guarantee. Um, a uh, heart monitor for, or an or a insulin monitor, I'm not sure what this is, but this is an example of something that has 100% SLA, right? You don't want to buy an insulin uh, reader that says, okay, 99% of the time we're going to get your insulin right. Um, <laughs> right? So, so some things really need to have a 100% SLA. Um, some things don't. Computers break. And so there, there actually exist uh, these extremely high reliability hard drives right now that you can buy. They fail. They, they promise they fail like once every thousand years or something, um, like assuming like a certain low pattern of use. And they're inordinately expensive. Uh, and this is kind of the fundamental trade-off, right? Ex uh, cost versus reliability. And so we define a lower SLA for things like computers um, so that we can actually make things happen. Because when you want to design a new heart monitor, you have to go through a huge design and QA process um, that takes years, and then you can release a new heart monitor. Google, we want to release stuff quickly. Like, we're in tech, you know, we have, we have people writing code every day, and so we don't want a 100% SLA. Um, it just doesn't work. If you go for 100% reliability, everyone's going to be unhappy. Uh, it's impossible to achieve, it's super expensive, it's just bad. Um, so instead we have these percentages, right? Um, oh, that's terrible. Uh, I'm sorry, that's cut off. But we talk about nines of availability. So one nine would be 90%, uh, two nines would be 99%, you know, five nines you get out to 99.999%, and that's less than a second of downtime per day. Um, and a question for you is, if Google went down, if all of Google went down for one second of every day, do you think you would notice? Um, so, that's, so that's kind of the whole point of this SLA, right? We don't, we don't need to be 100% reliable. You can fail some very small percentage of queries and you can totally live with that. Um, and especially, especially like, you know, there, there are a lot of other reasons that a query can fail than Google being down, right? Your internet could be down or your ISP could be doing maintenance or something. And users hit refresh. And so if you serve a 500 and then a user hits refresh and Google shows up, no one really cares. Um, no harm, no foul, right? So. We define these SLAs for all services, uh, all, all kind of critical services, and we say this is what we want it to be. Um, our error budget is one minus the SLA. So for example, if your SLA is 99%, if your SLA is three nines, sorry, uh, your error budget is 0.1%, which means that you have some number of errors or downtime, or yeah, downtime that you can just spend. And we really think of it as a budget. We have, we have these graphs that are like, here's how much budget you have. Um, so for example, if you get a billion queries a month, you can serve one million errors per month. You can serve one million five hundreds and it's fine. And then there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, you want to serve them, you want these to be spread out throughout the month. You don't want to have one chunk of time where you serve <laughs> one million errors to everyone. Um, and that's another part of SRE, but we, I don't think we're gonna have time to get there. Um, but you know, we, we basically, dev and SRE and product people all agree, this is the error budget. And SRE's job is to enforce that. Um, and dev kind of knows where their error budget is at. And so, um, they tend to spend it on changes. Um, they roll out new features and they break, and they spend their error budget and we roll it back. Um, so devs actually have an incentive to build a reliable service. Um, because if their service is unreliable, they don't get to launch. Um, and if the service is within SLA, SRE will roll things out happily. If the service is out of SLA, we say, no more, sorry, you're frozen. Um, you have to, you know, usually our SLOs are or SLAs are defined over a period of like a month. And so if you really burn through it, you may have to wait like a month before you can launch any new features. Um, sorry, we agreed on an error budget. You burned your budget on unreliability. That's it. 
Um, it doesn't become a power conflict. Dev team self-police, and it's, it's just a really nice uh, self-regulating system. Do we have any questions here? Take just a comment. It just seems that this is a wonderful example of how the it sounds as if the, the company is very consistent in applying principles of systems uh, air, um, negative feedback to, to every possible conflict. Yeah, so we have this guy, Ben Trainer Sloss, who's been kind of the head of SRE for like 11 or 12 years now. He was brought into Google uh, when production team was seven people. The people who kept Google, there were seven of them. And he is now the guy who like runs all of this. And he has all of these really, I mean, he spent like, he's a really smart dude. He spent like 12 years thinking about this, right? And his whole thing is like setting up the, the people incentives for reliability, right? Because you have to make people actually want it. And if devs don't care because devs never get paged, then you don't want it. Um, and I think I'm actually going to skip a huge portion of the rest of these slides because um, I have things that I want to get to. Um, but one important thing that I would like to say is that we actually give about 5% of customer issues and reliability issues back to the devs. And so the devs are still, we, we the SREs are kept in the development loop and we consult from our operational experience. The devs are also kept in the operations loop by having to solve some small number of customer issues. So in general, they still get to code and do their kind of software engineering thing, but they can't just completely, they can't get an SRE team and then totally say, okay, no more, like we're just gonna write our code, you guys manage it for us. And that's kind of another self-regulating system, right? Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah, you said incentive a minute ago. Um, are SREs paid or uh, rewarded or bonus stock whoever based on this kind of metrics? Um, we are not compensated based on our service reliability. We're compensated the same as like software engineers basically, which is you know, your salary and your other like, whatever compensation package. If I understand the SRE and uh, Google in those which is, they expect SREs to be able to be proactive and to develop solutions and to troubleshoot at, at less than 50% of the time. You're not meant to solve problems. You're meant to evolve the situation. Yeah. Um, I wish I had time to get to this. Yeah, but our, our whole, our whole uh, purpose is to prevent problems from happening more than just solving problems as they come up. Um, so when, when something really breaks, we write a post-mortem. And we have this notion of a blameless post-mortem where you can say, you know, this code was checked in and this is the offending code. And it's not pointing a finger at someone. It's just saying, here's, here's what happened, right? Um, because if, if you have some config file that people are going and manually editing, it's only a matter of time before someone edits it wrong. And even if you have someone reviewing it, it's only a matter of time before someone edits it wrong and the reviewer doesn't notice. And that can break everything. And so we, then we have this post-mortem culture of this, you know, this person wrote the code, this person didn't review it carefully enough. The question isn't why can't those people be better? The question is how can we set up systems so that this never happens again? Um, does that kind of answer what you were saying? Basically confirm that it's negative if you have to fix something and it's proactive, positive, yeah. it's encouraging. Yeah, so we have a hard rule that no SRE sp or no t SRE team spends more than 50% of their time on ops, and the rest of the time is spent automating the ops away, as people who see what the ops is like. Um, so we can skip a whole lot of this. <laughs> I just I just like you know copied their presentation. And, um, anyway, um, and now we can get back to my kind of thoughts um, on the cloud. Um, now that you all know, if there are any, I can, I can actually like stick around and give the rest of this presentation later if there's interest, but I think we should finish it. Um, if there are no more questions about SRE, I'll kind of now move to like where the cloud may be going. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a question, more of a comment. So the uh, VP you were mentioning, Ben, I think he has a talk from one of the conferences where he goes over like a lot of this stuff and a lot of these slides if people want to take a look at that too. So yeah, I think this is actually his slide deck. Um, so I will, I will uh, totally put his name up, yeah, yeah, um, or, or at least like he's like very heavily read over this. Um, and there's, and you know, there's the Site Reliability Engineering O'Reilly book that talks about these things. This is, this is, this is not like, this is not me saying, oh, look, I have this great idea. This is like stuff that's talked about a lot. If you look around for it, there's a lot of resources online of like how SRE works. Um, so if there are no more questions, great. Um, now we're back to me. Not as someone who's representing Google. Not as, I mean, I am a Google SRE, but I'm not. I'm taking that hat off, and I'm now just like a dude who's here to talk at Linux Fest Northwest about cloud. Um, I think we can see a lot more. We can expect to see a lot more successful companies built on the cloud. As uh, as we there was a really nice transition from the end of the SRE deck to this. I'm sorry, but it's a little abrupt now. Um, I think we can expect to see a lot of successful companies built on the cloud because as these cloud technologies get better and better, and as Google and Facebook and Mike, or Google and uh, Micro, Microsoft and Amazon. Um, kind of make public more and more of their like really heavily engineered tech internal technologies. Uh, more and more people can use them to do more and more cool things. Um, I think, unfortunately, we can expect to see more high-profile security breaches. Um, 
any security vulnerability becomes like a thousand times worse in the world where you have a thousand companies built on the same infrastructure. And I think we can expect to see far fewer unicorns. You know, this kind of like Facebook went, you know, got, got huge and Google got really huge and these companies are getting really huge. But I think um, there's kind of a fundamental like economic pro economics problem where if you're built on another company, you can't really get super huge because they're kind of taking some of your dollars too. Um, and so I kind of wonder if the cloud computing economy will prevent companies from being kind of, you know, fortune like 50, fortune 10 companies. Like it's, I, I, I don't know, it's just maybe, maybe we'll see it happen, but it's hard for me to imagine a world in which a company that's built purely on the cloud becomes a top 50 company, right, a fortune 50 company. Um, and because we're at Linux Fest, I have to say we can expect to see more government agencies poaching cloud engineers. Um, that happens. They pay well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you want to yell at me, these are my work email addresses. Um, feel free to send me as many profanities as you want, but I won't respond if there are too many. Um, but if you have more questions or if you say, hey, where was that talk from that guy, Ben, uh, Ben Trainer, my VP, or if you say, you know, hey, what was that book that you talked about? You know, it's online for free, I believe, um, or you can buy an O'Reilly copy. But feel free to send me an email. Um, yeah. And now we have questions, and these are war stories that I've been approved or have been approved to talk about uh, if anyone's curious to hear about some like big ways in which Google's broken. But I would prefer to prioritize questions about the talk. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about the third one, please? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so we have machines failing in our, we have, we have uh, our kind of custom built data centers, right? You know, Google, we build a lot of our own stuff, we design a lot of our own hardware and software, everyone knows this. Um, but sometimes we want to get closer to users. Um, so it, it can be hard to plop a data center down right in the middle of like London or something. Um, and so what we'll often do is we will have a co-location facility where we'll kind of like rent some space um, in a normal way from someone else, or we'll kind of have a much smaller cluster uh, but closer to users, basically just for better latency. And you can almost think of it as just like a really big cache. Um, when we want to turn down one of those clusters, or machines in those clusters break, for example, and we don't have you know, our, our data center text there, we basically have a, have a we basically wipe, we want to wipe the hard disk, right? Because it contains data in general, and like we care about protecting our data and our users' data. Um, so we have this thing called disk erase. That is the, it's the process that erases the disks of our satellite data centers. Um, um, and it does, it does some other stuff to like really get rid of it, but that's all proprietary, um, and I don't understand it anyway. Uh, so basically, the way that disk erase works is it gets a list of uh, machine host names that it needs to wipe. And so at one point, we had disk erase running over a set of machines, and it failed after wiping them. It does, so, so we have this automation to, to turn down a server that's broken, and part of it is disk erase. And so disk erase ran, and it completely wiped the, uh, the hard drives of these servers, and then the automation to turn down the servers failed. So we were running it again, because we need to actually turn down these servers, and we were watching it and debugging it. And the uh, automation correctly recognized that all machines had been disk, that the machines that it needed to turn, up, turn off had been disk erased. And so it gave the empty list to disk erase. It said, here's the list of machines that you need to, 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 need to wipe, and it was the empty list. Disk erase interpreted the empty list to mean everything, and it wiped all of our satellite data centers. Um, all of them, um, <laughs> like literally every one. Oh. Um, that would have taken a while, right? No, it took like 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so a disk erase that takes 30 seconds, that's what technology is that? I was like, is, is this a different <laughs> technology? Well, at least it, well, at least it might... chops the legs out immediately, right? What does, sir? I mean, I mean it, it might not take only like five seconds to do a whole drive, but it might take the legs out from under or anything. I mean, it, yeah. immediate, it immediately breaks it, that. It, it certainly it, can't use off. it while it's being wiped. Right. It was really fast. By the time we realized it, it was all gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all of it. Um, and so amazingly, Amazingly, I mean, we dropped some queries, of course. Um, we, we, you know, like we can't, yeah. Um, amazingly, within a few minutes, the only user visible impact was that like latency had gone up by order, like, you know, some, by like less than 100 milliseconds, basically, for almost all users. And so uh, my current manager was on traffic team, is what they're called um, at the time. And they're the team that is responsible for all traffic into and out of Google. Um, and she said they basically spent 48 hours straight 
putting all of the, all of the software back on all these disks because they didn't just erase the data; they erased, they wiped the disks, right? They like, totally nuked them from orbit. Um, so yeah, that's that's a that's a story. The post the postmortem has the line, the section what went well, and in it is Linux's RM command worked quickly. <laughs> I mean, dropped the whole center and it picked, you know, the, your system, that proved that your system is working the way it's supposed to work, too. Yeah, but then, you know, what went poorly, like, somehow, like, an empty list means wipe everything? Like, what is that? <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's good that we did appropriate capacity planning. It, it kind of, it, it was a te load test of our other systems and they worked. <laughs> yeah. So, with, with so much proprietary tooling that happens inside of Google, does it make it hard as a Googler to go out and look in they participate in any open source project that might come close to some of that stuff? Um, a lot of the time. I don't, I haven't actually tried to uh, hack on an open source project that's similar to something internally that we have, um, but I wonder if there would be some like maybe legal issues if I kind of like knew about our proprietary thing and took those design ideas outside. Um, I found that it's often actually not that hard to talk to people about things. Like I don't know the names of things, um, but in general a lot of the problems that are being solved in the open source community have or are being solved at Google as well. Um, kind of in parallel, and so, you know, usually there's a little bit of like terminology wrangling where I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, but then, but then it becomes pretty simple to to actually talk about things. And you know, there's there's a certain type of like DevOps and automation problem that is very general um, that Google has and the open source community has. Yeah. I'm just curious, what version of Linux do you use? Uh, I use OSX. Huh? I use OSX. I'm I'm not sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, but we I I uh, SSH into a. Uh, Ubuntu machine to do Linux. We have our own kind of Google Ubuntu security, whatever. Um, okay, I think I'm going to end this here, but I will continue hanging out and taking questions. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for being a good audience. You. And you can yell at me at these email addresses. So, is there uh, a lot of uh, caching uh, yes. mechanisms at Google that like cache layers in between? Yeah, we cache a lot, right? Because you know, a lot, a lot of data is reasonably static, right? Um, so, like, why, you know, if 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 an image tends to go through our network a lot, why would we keep having it go through our network? We could just say, oh, like a bunch of users over here are looking for the same.